Um, so yeah, my talk is about generalizing from sparse data and from learning from other people. It's meant to be a general introduction to my research and also the kind of the future directions of my lab uh, here in Tumi. Um, so as AI is being applied to increasingly more complex tasks, such as self-driving cars or robotics or healthcare, an important source of inspiration can come from human learning, which in contrast to state-of-the-art AI can be remarkably efficient, uh, robust, and adaptive. My, so my work uses ideas and tools for machine learning in order to better understand the representations and computations that humans use to actively seek out information and learn efficiently, where also a better understanding of these foundations of human intelligence will also be the key to unlocking new design principles for artificial systems as well. So the, the work I'm trying to uh, explore uh, takes on two complementary approaches, generalization and social learning. So with generalization, much like how you can generalize your enjoyment of one type of food, uh, for instance, tacos to another type of food, for instance, ramen, they share similar features such as spiciness. My work models generalization as a form of functional inference where functions that we infer represent a relationship or a hypothesis mapping some inputs to outputs. For instance, mapping level of spiciness in a food to your level of enjoyment. Uh, where a, a, uh, and this type of functional inference allows for a sort of kind of handful of previous observations, so these dots here, to generalize to a potentially infinite number of novel situations as well. So even though we can't experience all possible levels of spiciness, we can use generalization to inform us about where exploration along this dimension uh, is most promising. In addition, we don't only learn from our own experiences, but also from that of other people. So social learning offers many clear advantages since different people are informed by experiences distinct from our own, but also poses some unique computational challenges as well, requiring specialized mechanisms for learning in a social context. So this talk is structured around these two different uh, topics where uh, part one, I'll be talking about a uh, computational model of generalization, which, uh, is, uh, which we use to describe how humans are able to search efficiently in large problem spaces. In, in part two, I'll prevent, uh, present the current trajectory of research, which seeks to develop a comprehensive and computational theory of how we learn from other people. So part one, guided by generalization. So studies of human learning in the lab are commonly using these very simple tasks where participants repeatedly choose from a small number of choices in order to maximize reward. So here's an example of a two-armed bandit problem, uh, which imagines the decision maker in front of two different slot machines, where each has its own reward distribution, which is then exhaustively learned over repeated experience. You play these over and over again, eventually learn which uh, arm has a better reward distribution and you can use that to maximize the reward. But in real world problems, uh, such as finding a place to live, picking what to eat or choosing a research topic, uh, we can only ever explore a really small fraction of the total problem space, right? We can't try out everything to eat. We can't live everywhere. We can't we, uh, uh, be an expert in every single research topic. And yet there's a lack of understanding about how humans approach these problems, which don't permit exhaustive exploration, where we can't try out everything. So the, uh, the typical way that learning efficiency is studied, uh, both in AI and in, in cognitive science is uh, using the exploration exploitation dilemma, right? We have to balance these kind of tool, uh, two dual goals of either uh, exploring untried options in order to acquire new information, which can inform future decisions, or exploiting options which are, we already know to have high immediate rewards in order to acquire them right away, to maximize reward. Yet in, uh, in more real world problems, this distinction breaks down because it's not enough to know whether to explore or to exploit, we also need to know where to explore. So that's my research question here, is how do people navigate these vast environments where we can't explore all possibilities? Um, and to study this, uh, one experiment that uh, we conducted was using what we call spatially correlated bandits. So this is, uh, instead of these typical two-armed bandits or four-armed bandits that are commonly used in human research, we constructed a 121-armed bandit. So each of these different tiles is an arm of the bandit, and you can click it, uh, uh, click the options, and re-click them to uh, gain rewards. Um, and what we've done here is that we've uh, uh, arranged a spatial structure to the rewards such that nearby options will have similar rewards. So this spatial structure allows people to, uh, 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 to leverage uh, inferences about the environment uh, in order to provide traction for generalization. So they can use limited observations uh, about rewards and to, uh, to, to inform them about where exploration seems the most promising. 
So this is this was a typical trial of the experiment. I'll run it again really quickly, where participants are only able to sample a handful of the options in the total space uh, before the trial is over, and they're trying to maximize the rewards here. Yeah. Um, so, uh, so that's the end of the trial. So this is an example of what the fully revealed environment looks like, although participants only see uh, proportions of it uh, during during the trials. And we wanted to model how they searched in these different environments. Uh, in the paper, which came out in Nature Human Behavior, we had three different experiments where we had both one-dimensional environments uh, and two-dimensional environments, like I just shown you. Uh, and we also uh, um, compared both artificially generated reward structures, which uh, the difference between rough and smooth is that smooth environments have stronger spatial correlations. And we also had realistic natural environments as well, based on uh, crop yield data, where the rows and the columns of the grid correspond to the rows and columns of a farm. And the, uh, the reward structure corresponded to the, uh, the normalized yield of various crops, such as corn or wheat or lemons, where in these environments, there's also some uh, spatial structure, but it's not homogeneous, uh, both within the environment or, uh, and also between environments. And nevertheless, it has some spatial structure that allows people to generalize and search more efficiently. So participants were given a certain number of clicks uh, in order to maximize the reward. Um, and so the main uh, goal of this line of research is to understand the strategies that allow people to search efficiently. And what we find quite decisively is that exploration is not performed blindly or randomly, in contrast to this cartoon or to common textbook depictions. Rather, we find that search is very distinctively guided by generalizations. And we model this as a form of Bayesian inference about novel options, uh, where these Bayesian inferences make predictions about the expected reward and also uncertainty about novel options. And our results show that uh, search is very distinctively guided towards both of these ingredients. Um, altogether, in the main paper, we performed a large-scale comparison of 27 different models, and here I'm just going to focus on the best model, which consistently outperformed all others across a wide variety of manipulation checks. Um, and this was the GPUCB model, which combines a Gaussian process model of regression with upper confidence on sampling, and I'll walk through all the different steps. But uh, the, the basic idea is that at any point in time, given a set of observations in the environment, the model makes probabilistic predictions about where the participant will click next. And, uh, and so these red uh, tiles here represent high probability choices. So the first part uses Gaussian process regression uh, in order to make um, predictions about the expected reward, mu of x, and also the uncertainty, sigma of x, all the different options uh, on, on the grid. I simplify this here into a kind of a one-dimensional cartoon to better illustrate what the model is doing. And what it's doing, it's learning a function, mapping each of the uh, options, the spatial locations of each of the options, to some reward value, which is defined by some posterior mean, mu of x, and some uncertainty, uh, which is indicated by the band sigma of x. And of course, there's an infinite possible function, uh, set of functions that could, uh, um, could define any set of data that you have. And so what we do is we use uh, a, a radio basis function kernel as a way to introduce some inductive biases into, into, uh, into the functions that we learn. So the radio basis function kernel tells us that as the distance between two options increases, the similarity of the, the assumed similarity of rewards decays in this exponential function, where we have this parameter gamma, oh, sorry, this parameter lambda that defines the rates of this decay of generalization. So when lambda is large, we're assuming these very smooth functions uh, with really strong correlations that extend over large uh, distances. And when gamma is low, we assume more rough functions where there's less strong correlations. The correlations decay. Um, much more quickly. And so we model uh, uh, lambda here as a free parameter to uh, make some inferences about the uh, extent to which participants are generalizing. Uh, next, we take uh, the, the uh, predictions of the Gaussian process model, the, um, and we combine them together in a uh, linear weighted sum to, uh, to compute the upper confidence bound. So what this does is that it allows us to kind of balance the exploration, exploitation dilemma by taking the expected reward, mu of x, plus uh, the uncertainty where beta here is this uh, exploration weight. So beta tells us how much do we value exploring uh, uncertain options relative to exploiting high uh, expected value. Um, and so one other way we can think about what UCB is doing is that we're optimistically inflating our expectations of reward. We're taking the upper confidence bound. So the idea is that um, uh, in, the, in this uh, illustration here, um, 
uh, the, the darker uh, band corresponds to a smaller beta of 0.5, while the lighter band corresponds to a larger aspiration bonus uh, of one. So the arc max, when beta smaller, corresponds to this X here, which is close to where the, um, the, the highest expected uh, value is. But when beta is larger, we, we tend to explore towards more uncertain regions of the space to find viral and subjective estimates. Um, and so what we do uh, after we compute these UCB values is then we put them into a softmax uh, choice rule where um, we uh, have a free uh, parameter uh, tau, which defines the temperature of our predictions. So tau, when it's larger, corresponds to more noisy, more random uh, predictions. Whereas when tau is, uh, is lower, we correspond to much more precise predictions about where we think parties will search next. So you may notice that both beta and tau are both forms of expiration. So beta here is directed towards where we think we're the most uncertain, whereas tau is not directed. So uh, another way to think about this is that uh, beta is um, a form of directed exploration towards uncertainty, whereas temperature is more random, undirected exploration. Um, so these plots here are not just showing you an illustration, but are actually using the mean participant parameter estimates from, from our data. So these are painting a pretty accurate picture about the type of predictions we're making, which are these really tight predictions about where the participant will search next which is uh, just here, here, and here uh, in, in this case. Um, and um, I'm gonna illustrate the model results using uh, a representative vignette, where um, I'm gonna compare this Gaussian process model I just described to uh, a simple reinforcement learning model, uh, which is the Bayesian mean tracker. So this is, this is similar to a whole host of types of traditional reinforcement learning models, which learns the value for each option independently. So uh, consistent with the risk score, the Wagner model or Q learning model or common filter, this Bayesian mean tracker uh, learns uh, a ba uh, um, Bayesian estimation of the word values for each option independently. And so this can somewhat balance the exploration and exploitation dilemma, but it does not generalize. Um, and it offers no guidance about where to explore. All unobserved options are defaulted to some, some prior uh, uh, mean and prior uncertainty. So in, and we contrast this with what we call this function learning model, this Gaussian process model I just uh, described. Um, and this uses function approximation as a way to generalize about novel options, so options we've never experienced before. And this is not the only type of model that can use function approximation. So neural network function approximators uh, have been very successful in, generalize, uh, in improving generalization in, for instance, deep reinforcement learning, such as the AlphaGo model. But here we use the Gaussian process model as something equivalent um, and perhaps a bit more interpretable from a psychological perspective. And so this model can also balance the exploration and exploitation dilemma using the same sampling strategies available to traditional reinforcement learning models. But because it also makes predictions about uh, unexplored options and generalizes, uh, we can uh, make better predictions about where participants will explore through, uh, through this nature of generalization. Okay. So I'm going to compare the, the out of uh, sample predictive accuracy of these different models. So higher is better. It's a type of pseudo R squared. Um, but I'm going to also combine with, uh, uh, with uh, uh, three different types of uh, sampling strategies. So I've already um, shown you the UCB model, which combines the expected reward plus uncertainty. But I can also decompose the sampling strategy into its constituent parts. So we can define a model that only values expiration. And we can find the model that only values exploitation. So here's the predictive accuracies of these two different um, learning models combined with these different sampling strategies. So at first, this pure explore model is not uh, uh, very good at predicting behavior. Oh, sorry. Um, this, um, then we can try a test in, uh, in terms of their ability to uh, uh, predict using only the uh, expected rewards. So this pure exploits model we see that the Gaussian process is much better than the Bayesian mean tracker. But when we combine uh, both the expected uncertainty and uh, the expected rewards together into this UCB strategy, we find that uh, this is kind of more than the sum of its parts for the Gaussian process model, that we're able to predict much better with this, although there's relatively little increase for the Bayesian mean tracker, because it doesn't generalize and it doesn't make these uncertainty predictions that are sensitive to nearby options as well. So ultimately, we find that both the generalization component of the Gaussian process model and the directed uh, uh, exploration, which is uh, defined here in the, uh, the UCB strategy, are both necessary for predicting human behavior. 
So this was not just a one-off study, but has uh, more or less defined uh, a, a new research paradigm where we use the same type of framework to also study differences between children and adults in their ability to explore and, and how they explore. We also use this to describe uh, a generalization, not only based on spatially correlated rewards, but based on graph structured rewards as well. Uh, we use this, use this to compare how people search using spatial structures, but uh, versus using abstract conceptual uh, stimuli as well, such as these Gabor patches, where the, the reward structures are defined based on the tilt uh, and the strike frequency of the Gabor patches. Uh, and much like the game of Minesweeper, where people are not only trying to acquire rewards, but also trying to avoid certain outcomes at all costs, we also find that the Gaussian process model is able to describe how people generalize in these kind of uh, uh, risky, uh, sorry, in these uh, safe uh, problems where they need to avoid certain outcomes. Um, we've been currently testing how um, this model can be used to, uh, um, uh, to diagnose clinically depressed populations. Um, and in the second part of my talk, I'll show you how we've also adapted this to a, search, a social search problem in a virtual reality environment. So um, this, for the next part of this talk, I'm gonna focus uh, on these two projects here. So part uh, 1.2, learning like a child. Um, so one thing that I've heard Josh Tannenbaum, who's a professor at MIT say quite a lot is that children are the only known information processing system that just demonstrably and reproducibly develop into intelligent systems. And so this is not a new idea, of course. Uh, already back in the 1950s, Alan Turing was suggesting that we should try to build AI that learns like a child. Well, how exactly do children learn differently than adults? Well, one robust finding in literature is that they're highly variable. So this is kind of a time lapse of a, one uh, baby playing with different uh, objects. So they're really trying out many different things and it's quite difficult to predict what uh, they would uh, try next. And this extensive variability in search behavior has led to, to uh, a really influential hypothesis from Alison Gopnik that uh, says that children have high temperature sampling, right? So this appeals to this metaphor of simulated annealing, which is a method in stochastic gradient descent, where in search or optimization initially is very random, very stochastic. And then over time, this cools off and becomes more exploitative. Right, so the hypothesis from Alice and Gopnik is that children are a high temperature because they're trying to avoid getting stuck in a local optimum. And over the lifespan, uh, this temperature, this random variability uh, decreases. Well, that is one very uh, interesting hypothesis, but it's not the only hypothesis for how um, uh, exploration behavior changes over the course of development. So yes, it could be a change in random exploration, but it could also be uh, some other uh, mutually uh, um, inclusive hypotheses as well. For instance, uh, as we get older, we develop more complex cognitive representations and cognitive processes. Uh, and for instance, this could lead to broader generalizations as we define richer uh, representations in the environment. This could also lead to a change in the, in the variability of our behavior. Um, in addition, uh, these changes in exploration can also stem not from random exploration, but from directed exploration, right? And I introduced this previously, but where people are, are seek, actively seeking out what they think they're most concerned about, as opposed to just behaving randomly. And of course, young children and babies, um, there's much more uncertainty in the world, right? And you may have already saw this coming, but these, oh, sorry, these three different hypotheses correspond to the three different parameters of the model I just introduced. So the Alison Gopnik hypothesis corresponds to the temperature parameter of the softmax model. Uh, uh, generalization corresponds to the lambda in the RBF kernel for the Gaussian process. Uh, and beta corresponds to the direct exploration bonus in the ECD sampling. So to test this, uh, we, uh, uh, I programmed the, the experiment onto a tablet. And we tested this in, uh, among children and adults uh, uh, in museums in Berlin. So we had children. Uh, between the ages of seven to 11 and also adults from the same uh, populations. And uh, here are the main results where uh, I'm plotting the parameter estimates for the three different parameters as a function of age in the different colors. So what we find is that children uh, generalize less than adults. So there's lower lambda estimates than adults. So here's a seven to eight, nine to 11 and 18 plus. Um, and at the same time, they also have a higher exploration bonus. So they're more uh, exploring on certain options more eagerly than adults. So the, this is a strong result here. But what we find is that they're simply not more random. There's no difference in temperature. 
We also tested alternative forms of uh, random uh, expiration as well, such as the epsilon greedy model. And again, we don't find any meaningful differences in age. So what this tells us is that we get a much richer understanding of this developmental trajectory of search behavior. Uh, this extra variability, uh, which again, we, we do find, is not due to them being more random, but differences in how they value uncertainty and how they generalize a kind of for structure in the world. Um, and again, based on these parameters, our model can simulate learning curves that recover the same distances as, as our participants. So this can recover the same differences in terms of age, uh, which are the different colors, and also between the environmental conditions, the smooth versus rough environments I showed earlier, uh, between the dotted and solid lines. Now, this is just the model, but we're also wanting to see um, if we can interpret something, can opening up the black box. Uh, so we asked them some, for some judgments about options. We want to make sure that the predictions of the GP correspond to what they're actually believing. Um, and so in the very last round, we called it a bonus round to make it exciting for the kids. Uh, we randomly selected five different tiles that were not observed yet partway through a round. So they made 15 out of 25 clicks, and then they were interrupted for the bonus round, and they were asked to make judgments about five different tiles. So they gave us predictions about how many points they think they will receive, so an expected value estimate. And they can move the slider, and the, the tile would change color dynamically. And we also asked for a confidence judgment as well. So how confident they were about uh, their, um, their, their estimate. So after they make these five different judgments about these highlighted tiles, they, asked, they had a forced choice to choose one of the five options that they made judgments about. And then the round continued as, uh, as normal. Um, and so here, what I've done is I've standardized the judgments of expected value and certainty by taking the chosen option and dividing it by the sum of all the other options. So a higher uh, uh, standardized judgment will indicate a larger contribution towards the, fi higher, uh, the final choice. So we find no difference in terms of expected value here, right? So part, uh, adults and children were equally likely to choose options that they thought were high value. But what we find here is a difference in how younger children were more likely to choose options they themselves rated as being less certain. So uh, based on their own subjective judgments, we're also again able to see a difference in terms of how younger children value uncertainty and in terms of how they actively seek uncertainty. Um, so just to quickly summarize, we find that children generalize less but explore uncertain options more eagerly than adults, but we find no evidence that children are simply more random in their, uh, in their exploration. And the current goal is to better plot out the entire trajectory over the lifespan of generalization and exploration from the age of four to 64. So in a current paper that's under review, we collected data from even younger children, uh, uh, four up. And so we had to remove the numbers because we can't trust children to, at that, uh, that age to also read uh, numbers up to 50. And there we find the same trends in terms of a, a change in expiration bonus and change in generalization. But there we also do see some uh, changes in expiration, uh, in temperature as well, in terms of random expiration. So, in those younger ages of between five, four and six, we do may, uh, perhaps find some differences in randomness. Um, and we're also currently analyzing some data based on adolescence, where adolescence is a specifically uh, uh, interesting time period because their teenage years offer many unique opportunities for exploration and also risk taking, where we see some interesting patterns emerge in this group where there's a heightened sensitivity uh, in between the 17 and 20 year olds to low reward values. Uh, but also a high sensitivity, a high probability of consecutively selecting neighboring options. So these are some trends we're still trying to figure out as we um, move more in this direction. Um, so part 1.3, exploiting structured spaces. So, so far I've talked about how we can generalize based on some notion of uh, um, distance in some feature space. So as two stimuli are uh, further apart in some feature space, we assume that they're less similar, and we can model this using the RBF kernel. But there's other environments which are not so continuous, but rather discrete. For instance, navigating uh, a subway or rail network or the public transportation network here in Tübingen. And in these environments, uh, relationships uh, may be asymmetric. They can be restricted based on the transition dynamics. Uh, and they're very much structured in a way that's not corresponding just to Euclidean distance, right? And so in these cases, we can model generalization using a diffusion kernel as a type of graph kernel that defines uh, similarity based on uh, a more structured notion of similarity based on uh, transition structure. Um, and in the case of an uh, infinitely fine lattice graph, um, these two kernels are exactly equivalent. And so what this means is that all these previous results I've described uh, with the RBF kernel 
are a special case of this diffusion kernel. So we can essentially here, we're trying to uh, uh, bring these results to a broader framework, which also can describe structure spaces. And so uh, I just wanna first kind of illustrate what I mean by generalization based on transition dynamics, what similarity structure means in, uh, in graph uh, um, spaces. So let's take, let's take this really simple grid rule task where there's a reward at A. Um, even though C is closer to A in terms of the Euclidean distance, um, the fact that there's a wall here means that the transition dynamics make it harder for C to reach A than B to reach A. And this is clear to anyone who's in an office right now. Maybe there's some person on the other side of the door. Uh, you have to go around to the door to actually see them. And actually, currently, it's not so easy <laughs> given uh, social distancing. Right, so the idea here is we're make, we're, we should be generalizing our awards based on how likely it is to reach uh, a different uh, location based on the transitions that are allowed. Um, and just like we can learn functions in the continuous space, we can also learn functions in a discrete space as well. Right, so in the continuous space, we have some similarity metric based on distance. So Euclidean distance and feature space. This is captured by the RBF kernel. And then given some observations about function values, we can then make uh, these kind of Bayesian predictions about uh, possible uh, uh, values, even for options we have not observed before in this, um, uh, in this input space. And uh, similarly, on discrete graph structures, we can define similarity based on the transition dynamics, uh, which are captured by the diffusion kernel. And then given some observations about these nodes here in the color nodes, we can make Bayesian predictions as well about the, 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 the values of nodes uh, that we have not observed before, where the, the size of the halo in, indicates the uncertainty. So larger halo is more uncertain about those uh, predictions. So in this paper, which came out just this, a couple of months ago, uh, we had two experiments looking at how people make predictions and search for rewards. Uh, I'm gonna focus on experiment two uh, for this talk where we had people uh, perform a bandit task similar to what I've described before. So they're trying to maximize rewards and rewards here are correlated based on the graph structure. So connected nodes have similar rewards. And we also had a bonus round. So we also have some judgment data as well, I can show you. So I'm gonna jump right to the model results. And I've already previously shown you um, the Gaussian process model and the Bayesian mean tracker model as, uh, as examples of models that either generalize or don't generalize. Um, but we can also here tested the successor representation, which is a um, model um, that's attributed to Peter Dayan, who's the director uh, at the Max Planck in here in Tübingen. And this model is able to generalize by learning a representation of the transition dynamics. And it can do this either by uh, assuming a random policy or based on uh, um, a, a TD error model. So you're essentially learning based on prediction error sequentially. Um, and importantly, the main distinction between these different models is that while this successor representation also generalizes, um, it only makes point estimates about the values, uh, about value estimates, right? So it's only capable of performing random exploration, whereas both of these models above uh, uh, have Bayesian predictions and therefore allow us to do both directed exploration and random exploration. So the key ingredient for doing directed exploration is having some representation of uncertainty. Um, and so we also then tested some other simple heuristic models that don't generalize uh, in, the, in the traditional sense. For instance, uh, a K nearest neighbors model, where the uh, prediction for some unobserved node is just the average of the K nearest neighbors. And we can also have a D nearest neighbors model, which is rather than a fixed number of K neighbors, it has all the nodes within a fixed D distance. Um, and when we did a hierarchical model comparison, we find that uh, overwhelmingly uh, the Gaussian process model was the best model uh, in, in the population for predicting our human, uh, participants. So again, we're able to describe behavior not only on spatial, spatially structured environments, but also on graph structured environments as well. Now, we did a much more cleaner validation on the, uh, the judgments as well. So uh, we, it's similar to this bonus round with the kids where at the very end, uh, partway through a round, they're shown a series of uh, unobserved nodes and asked to uh, make predictions about how many points they observe. Uh, so expected value and how confident they are. So they're on underlying uncertainty. And what's really cool is that based on the search data, so based on their, their sequence of choices, we're fitting the model uh, parameters on that. We can then kind of do this out of task uh, uh, validation where we can then predict their judgments uh, on, the, on these nodes. So based on search data, we can predict their judgments uh, and we have a relatively high accuracy here. Uh, and we're not only able to predict their judgments about the expected rewards, but also their uncertainty as well where um, options that participants were least confident about 
corresponding to the highest uncertainty estimates, or, sorry, highest uncertainty predictions of the Gaussian process model. Okay, so the gas, if people are not only behaving as if they're generalizing according to this Gaussian process model, but their predictions and their own judgments themselves are also corresponding to the predictions of the model. And at this point, I just want to kind of connect this to kind of a larger uh, scope of uh, theories uh, in cognitive science and, and in AI, where um, uh, there's a general framework that's been introduced um, several years ago. Um, sorry, I guess two years ago now, uh, known as episodic reinforcement learning, which is, provides a framework for, for generalization. So the idea is that we store a memory for each previously encountered stimuli and its reward, right? So we have some previous states and you write this to some memory buffer. We have some maybe a vector embedding of these different states uh, and some representation of the reward value we, have, we observed from the state. So when we have some new state that we observe, we can then really simply generalize based on this uh, similarity weighted sum. So we compare this new state to each of the previous states we've encountered, we get the measure of similarity, and we multiply that similarity by the reward value of that option. And we then sum this up, and we get this nice and simple value estimate for this new state, right? Well, this is also exactly equivalent to what the Gaussian process model is doing in terms of how it computes the expected reward. Um, so we can think about the, this is the um, expected reward for some new option X star, is a sum of all the previous uh, options we've encountered in the past, uh, times this weight, times the kernel similarity. So, for, so uh, this new option to all the previous options we've encountered. And this weight here has its normalization factor and the reward value for that option. So it's exactly the same format as the episodic RL, and also has the exact same format as an RBF network as well, where the RBF network uh, uh, has been compared to how people generalize in, in various visual motor control tasks, um, and is essentially the same formulation I just described here, where the weights uh, go, um, um, where each of these different radio basis functions correspond to a specific episodic uh, uh, memory of a state that we encountered in the past, and the weights are stored here on these uh, edges. And they're just summed up at the end. But crucially, the GP makes predictions about uncertainty as well. And we've seen uh, through all these uh, studies uh, that this is a, a crucial ingredient as well. Um, and so um, this leaves open um, uh, an important gap between uh, what our model uh, can explain and what these other models can't. So just really briefly for the conclusions, I asked uh, for this part, how do we navigate vast problem spaces? And I've showed that uh, combination of generalization and directed exploration uh, allows us to provide a very powerful model for efficient learning across many domains. Um, and we model generalization as a form of functional inference where we can predict search decisions, we can simulate human-like performance, and we can predict judgments about expected reward and confidence. And the underlying mechanisms here of Bayesian inference, kernel similarity, and episodic reinforcement learning have many uh, deep and interesting theoretical connections to other models of neuroscience and computer science. And yet there's still some open questions. And one I'm hoping to, uh, to tackle with my, my new lab here to begin is how do people perform this type of inference, uh, especially at scale, uh, where we have uh, episodic memories of many, many previous observations where the, the, uh, and computationally the GP slows down uh, in terms of how, uh, as we get more observations in the past, the, the computations become more and more complex. Whereas for humans, we actually speed up when we have more experience. Um, and we do all this despite limited cognitive resources as well. So I'm hoping to tackle that question. Um, I'm getting to part two, but I'm realizing I'm a bit late on time, so I'm gonna try to um, speed through a couple of things. So part two is about how we learn from other people. And this is how we used to have conferences back in the day, I guess. So I began my critique with the, uh, uh, my talk with a critique about how research and learning has focused on repeat interactions with a small set of stimuli. But another uh, critique is that we're often studying learning in imposed isolation, where uh, most studies uh, essentially assume that we're in this uh, vacuum, interacting with some, uh, some environment. But uh, in contrast, the majority of our interactions, even despite social distancing and uh, the, the COVID pandemic, they're still in a social context, right? where our actions influence are in turn influenced by other people. So this branch of my research really seeks to bring the study of human learning out from isolation and back into our natural social environment, which I guess is also a very timely problem these days as well. Um, so um, what, what I to argue is that far from being a peripheral feature, the capacity for social learning is a defining characteristic for human intelligence. And I'll speed through this a bit. This is a paper in Science by Herman et al, where they found that uh, humans and chimpanzees and orangutans performed 
uh, almost identically in terms of physical reasoning tasks, so reasoning about the physical world around us, but it's only in the social domain for, for instance, uh, uh, looking at how people infer mental states or uh, communication that we truly excel and, um, uh, and differentiate ourselves from our nearest ancestors. And it's really the social learning over writ large over multiple generations that really has uh, uh, led to the success of our species. It's through multi-generational innovation that produces cumulative culture that allows us to survive, right? It's why we're able to survive in the tundra and in the, um, in the Earth's orbit, yet few of us could really survive alone in the woods for more than a few days. It's not our own individual intelligence, but it's our capacity for social learning. And uh, learning from other people is not exactly the same as learning from the environment. So this is the uh, reinforcement learning framework from Sassan Barto, where when we learn from other people, the feedback from the environment is very different than feedback from other people because social information is shaped by goals and beliefs and pedagogical intentions of other people as well. So we can't simply shove social information in place of the environment, but rather we need some different, uh, different framework and different mechanisms to understand social learning. And one mechanism designed for this is a collective search task in a, in a virtual environment. So in this task, the goal is to uh, smash these melons and acquire as many rewards as possible. Where rewards are indicated by these splashes of blue, right? You can see some of their players acquiring it. And so crucially, when you, uh, when, uh, you can also see when other people acquire rewards, so you can use that social information. Rewards in this case are, uh, are spatially correlated. So there's near, uh, rewards are nearby to each other, such that when you see someone else finding a reward, you can use that to imitate them, to then go over there and start smashing other blocks near them as well. So um, normally I would show this interactive tutorial, but it's a bit short. Uh, I'm a bit short for time, uh, but essentially we teach people that, uh, how to smash melons, you have to click and hold, um, and we have different um, reward structures in the environment as well. So, so here melons are mapped to smooth environments, which have correlated reward structures. And in this other condition, they're mapped to random environments. So pump, they're pumpkins for some reason here. Um, so uh, there's no structure in the environment. And participants and also search in both uh, individuals uh, as both solo, uh, solo searchers and also in, in groups of four. And so we can pair these differences within the subject. And so uh, the reason we use this virtual reality component is that uh, uh, we have uh, this limited field of view in the task creates a trade-off between focusing on individual search and looking at other people for imitation. So time you spend looking at other people's time not spent uh, foraging individually as well. So we have this nice tension. Um, and um, we can think about this as a type of producer scrounger game, which has been really well studied in animal literature, but much less well studied in human uh, um, uh, research on humans as well. So the idea is that producers are searching for new rewards uh, uh, in the environment and scroungers are imitating them. And so here's an example of what this task looks like with birds. Um, and this corresponds to many other human problems as well. For instance, stock markets, do you copy what current trends are, or do you try to invest in something no one else has tried? To maybe you're to discover some new um, hidden gems, also technology innovations, and also in science. Um, and the reason this is why the studies is, uh, this producer scrounger problem is why they studied is that it offers insight into what's known as Rogers paradox. So in the simplest case, Rogers paradox describes how the fitness of social learners, these scroungers from the previous slide, uh, depends on the number of other social learners in the population. So when there's no social learners in the population, it really pays off to scrounge, to imitate other people. But when there's complete saturation of social learners in the population, one, then there's nobody coming up with new innovations, no one finding new uh, reward patches. And so this leads to a collapse in the fitness of the population. Um, and in more realistic settings where people can have different levels of social individual learning, an analogous trade-off still exists, where collect, uh, successful collectives need to balance both individual and social learning. So this is what this project is seeking to understand. How do collectives negotiate this balance? Uh, and how can they, uh, do they adapt this balance to the demands in the environment? In these smooth environments, it pays off to, to copy because there's a structure in the rewards uh, where other people finding rewards can tell you what, what future rewards are. But in random environments, there's no structure. And so copying other people has no benefit. And we're hoping that people, more people will copy in the smooth environments than in the uh, um, random environments. Um, and so this data uh, from this experiment brings together like a really unprecedented combination of both spatial trajectories. So illustrated here, um, their visual field data. So we know exactly what they see 
um, and we can kind of recreate this in these simulations such that we can automatically annotate which objects and which players were visible at a specific point in time. And together we can build these really rich social networks of their, both their visibility and spatial locations in order to understand the rich dynamics of social learning. Um, so I'll quickly go through the data here where uh, I'm only showing some early data, which um, since due to COVID, we had to pause our collection, data collection back in March. Um, and what we find, uh, what I'm going to describe first is in terms of social attention. So we define this in terms of the average number of other players that are visible, right? So when more players are visible, uh, um, this is a signal that people are looking at other people more often. And what we, so uh, I'm going to call this uh, average visible peers variable, social attention for simplicity. What we find is that there's higher vis social attention in smooth environments. People are looking at other people more often in smooth environments. Um, and, the, and this difference uh, increases over rounds as well, the difference between environments. Now, we can also build these visibility networks where these directed edges correspond to the duration uh, of another player being visible to a specific player. We can see who's looking at who and to, for, for how long. Um, and this allows us to define um, the out degree and in degree of each of the players over these rounds. Uh, and we can think about in degree, which is all the weight of all the edges protruding into me, as a celebrity factor. How much are other people looking at me? And the out degree, we can interpret as a type of paparazzi factor. How much am I looking at other people? And what we find is that um, seeing is inversely correlated with being seen in the random environments, oh, sorry, in the smooth environments. So people, we see specialization here. We have celebrities who are not looking at other people. And we have these paparazzis who themselves are not being looked at. Uh, but in the random environments, we have no correlation between these variables. So we see that there's kind of specialization is what's driving this balance of social, uh, social learning versus individual learning in the uh, smooth environments. Um, I'm gonna kind of skip some of, the, uh, some of these results for now and kind of focus on this analysis we did to look at how we can measure social influence. Um, and this is based on pull events extracted from movement patterns. So this is inspired by methods used to study uh, populations of wild baboons, uh, which were geotracked. And the idea is that we select candidate uh, pull events based on looking at the pairwise distances between participants. So this is uh, between two participants. We see the distance, they're, they're moving, uh, they're getting closer together, they're getting further apart. And our poll candidates uh, are defined based on some uh, min, max, min sequence. So when they're close together, they're far apart, and they're close together again. And we filter this by several desiderata. So we filter first that by, by strength, so the change in distance is large relative to the absolute distance. So it's a proper, uh, change rather than just a little wiggle. Uh, we also filter by disparity. That one player moves more than the other in each segment. So there's, uh, and we also filter by leadership, where one player moved more in the first segment uh, and less in the second. So here's an example of a poll where we have here the leader move from this position at time one to time two to time three. We have a follower moving from here to time two to time three. And so what, what happens is that the, the leader here moves and finds a new patch while at the same time, the follower tries to forage down this bottom corner, but finds nothing. The follower turns around, sees that this uh, leader has found some rewards, and then moves in to imitate. So we call this a poll. And what we find is that a much higher uh, frequency of poll events in smooth environments, uh, which suggests that people are much more influenced uh, um, uh, socially in the smooth environments, which corresponds to the fact that it's much more advantageous in the, the, based on the reward structure. Um, so ultimately, this work is trying to build towards a computational theory of social learning. So here I'm trying to answer this when question. So when to learn socially, but when to learn individually uh, through this balancing of social individual learning. Uh, I have uh, an open project uh, with my former advisors at Harvard. We're trying to use um, theory of mind uh, based on inverse reinforcement learning as a model uh, in order to model how people perform selective imitation. We're trying to take the observed actions of other people to infer their hidden beliefs and then selectively imitate uh, people who have different beliefs from ours. Um, I'm using uh, uh, a model uh, from robotics uh, uh, where we're, uh, in order, and adapting it to the social individual learning uh, framework where um, we're trying to look at how people generalize uh, social information versus individual information. So for instance, on Amazon, when you're buying some, some product, different people have different preferences about what they like 
But nevertheless, you can still um, use that information productively to inform your own uh, uh, decisions. But perhaps you generalize uh, social information less strongly than your own because uh, of these differences and preferences. Um, I've also uh, tried to understand the game theoretic uh, um, the game theoretics of, of, of social learning, where one important question is, when uh, is it beneficial uh, uh, to share information? Yeah, and, uh, and in competitive context specifically is one domain we're trying to understand. We're refining this kind of robust, um, uh, um, robust benefit for sharing information, uh, even uh, in competitive context, which tries to explain, for instance, this open science movements as well. And uh, lastly, I'm also trying to understand these processes at scale. We're using this game, One Hour, One Life, to understand the processes of multi-generational innovation in cumulative culture, where uh, incremental uh, um, innovations uh, can lead to these large-scale and profound changes at multi-generational level as well. So this is a kind of a ma massive multiplayer uh, game where participants live out a life within uh, one hour. Um, and we have this massive amount of data from, from, from these players and we're able to understand how uh, technological progress develops over um, uh, multiple generations. Um, so I apologize, it's a bit late on time, so I was gonna quickly go to my conclusions. Um, I guess my overarching research question here is how do we navigate vast problem spaces? The first part of my talk, my answer I tried to give you was that generalization and direct exploration provide really powerful tools. But there are still some unanswered questions about the actual neural limitations that people have and how we can scale these to more complex problems. The second part of my talk, I focused on um, taking advantage of all the social information that's around us and learning from that. And this is really powerful for uh, leveraging the experiences of other people, but it also requires a new computational framework uh, to understand the specialized mechanisms that we use to learn uh, uh, in a social and cultural context. So I'd like to thank my collaborators on these different projects and thank you for your time.